Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Out of the box, we see that this writer, his name is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just anybody. He was somebody. He knew Jesus. He saw the miracles. He heard the sermons. He tried to understand the parables. But he was there for it all. Not merely an eyewitness, but a significant, intimate participant in the life of Jesus Christ. He was a resident from northern Galilee, born in Bethsaida, but moved about six miles west to Capernaum, where he was a fisherman by trade. His brother Andrew introduced him to Jesus. And at their first meeting, Jesus renamed him. His real name was Simeon, his Hebrew name. Jesus named him Cephas, which in Aramaic means rock, then translating it, as the writers of the New Testament did, into the Greek of the day, it was Peter. Simeon translated in the Greek is Simon. And so together, bundled and translated together, he was Simon Peter. We know that he was a husband. We know this because he had a mother-in-law who was healed by Jesus. We don't know his wife's name, but we know of his mother-in-law's sickness. After a miraculous catch of fish, he's pulling, or before a miraculous catch of fish, he, he's, he's pulling in to, to the harbor, and Jesus is there from a boat preaching on the water, and he asks Peter, pull out again into the deep and drop your nets. And Peter says, Lord, we've been working all night long and caught nothing. Jesus says, do it. And Peter says, for you, I'll do this. And so he's obedient to the Lord. And later when he pulls on board his boat, a miraculous catch of fish, we see him as a repentant disciple where he says to the Lord, have mercy on me, Lord, I'm a sinner. And he became a follower of Jesus. Jesus called him to be an apostle, which means messenger, someone who is sent. He was sent by Christ to represent Christ. He had participated in the ministry of Christ from the very beginning, from his baptism by John. He was an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection all the way to the time of Jesus' ascension into heaven. And in any of the lists of, that are given of the disciples in the Gospels, Peter is always the first one mentioned. He is the preeminent disciple. When he's trying to walk on water after Jesus calls out to him, and he begins to walk out there, but then the winds begin to pick up and his faith ebbs and he begins to sink. He is the sinking disciple. Nevertheless, when Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they come up with all kinds of answers. It's Peter who is the bold proclaimer. He's the proclaiming disciple. And he breaks the silence by responding with, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. Later in that same passage, when Jesus discloses to his disciples his intent to go to Jerusalem and to suffer and to be killed, and on the third day to raise, be raised from the dead, Peter takes him aside and says, Far be it from you, Lord. May it never be. But Jesus looks right at him, and he says to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So he becomes, at that point, the significantly misguided disciple, or possibly the satanically misguided disciple. Less than a week later, he's privileged to witness, along with James and John, the transfiguration of Jesus. He's also the miraculous tax-paying disciple. You remember the story in, in Matthew where people are coming to Jesus and they ask him about paying the tax. Jesus takes a coin and says, whose face is on it? 
They say Caesar's, and he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. But so that you know that I'll pay my taxes, he tells Peter, go, drop a line in the water, catch the fish, inside the fish's mouth will be a coin, go pay the tax. And it's as it happens. In the upper room, when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, Peter becomes the overzealous disciple, saying, wash me completely. And Jesus says, no, you don't need that. Later, he becomes the brash, boasting disciple at the Last Supper, saying to Jesus, even if I must die with you, I will never deny you. Later, he becomes the violent, aggressive disciple in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just, as, just ask Malchus, the servant of the high priest. They come to arrest Jesus. Peter takes out his sword. Obviously, Peter was a card-carrying member of the National Sword Association. Takes a whack at those who were with the high, or those representing the high priest and takes off the ear of Malchus, servant of the high priest. Jesus reaches and puts the ear back in place, and Peter runs for his life. After Jesus is arrested on three separate occasions, he's the denying disciple, telling his others that he doesn't even know Jesus, was never with him. But when the rooster crows, he remembers Jesus' prediction that indeed he would deny him, not once, but three times. And he becomes a bitter, weeping, remorseful disciple because he had denied his master. Upon hearing of the empty tomb, he and John, the Apostle John, are involved in a foot race. John's first on the scene. He records himself being the fastest, but it was Peter who first entered the tomb to discover the linen grave clothes and the folded face cloth where Jesus had been laid. Later that evening, while Peter and the other disciples are hiding, Jesus appeared to them. And he says to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. On the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Peter has a private audience with Jesus. But in John chapter 21, Jesus doesn't use the name he gave to Peter. He goes back to square one. He addresses him three times as Simon, son of John. And he asks him three times, do you love me? And each time, Peter reaffirms his love for Jesus. And in those times, Jesus recommissions him to shepherd his sheep. We see him in the upper room after the ascension as the student disciple, pouring through the scriptures to see where Jesus lines up with the Old Testament and what is taking place. He explains to the disciples about the loss of Judas, and it was ordained of God through the scriptures. Because of that bold proclamation that he gave in Matthew 16, that you're the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus gave to him the keys to the kingdom. And we see Peter in Acts chapter 2 unlocking the kingdom of Christ for the Jews who have come around the world to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. He proclaims to them the crucified Christ and risen Christ and 3,000 are saved in one day. He will use another key to unlock the kingdom of Christ to the Samaritan believers. And then while in Joppa, he will, having received a triple vision spectacular from God, um, showing him what was once unclean is now clean, he is summoned to Caesarea, and there he will use a key to unlock the kingdom of Christ for the Gentiles who would believe. He's the healing and resurrecting disciple. He healed a man who was lame at the temple. He healed a man who was bedridden. He healed a woman or raised from the dead a woman named Dorcas. He knows what it means to be arrested and persecuted. He is both a prisoner and a miraculous escapee. He is the evangelical El Chapo of the first century. He got out of jail twice for miraculously just unbelievable stories one time he's arrested and they're and they're trying to figure out what to do with him and they're while they're talking he's out in the middle of the courtyard proclaiming christ the next time he's arrested he's 
held in bondage and they've got him surrounded by uh, guards and he's chained to them and he's in the inner jail and an angel comes and releases him. He's a bold defender of the gospel before rulers. In each of his sermons, he does not let it get past their attention that they crucified and killed God's appointed Messiah. He's a confronter of disobedient believers, Ananias and Sapphira, and their effort to take from God what belonged to him. They dropped dead at Peter's feet. To Simon the magician, a man who's trying to gain the powers that they have for, gain, for his own gain, and, and he's confronted by Peter. Peter is an allowed exhorter for inclusion of the Gentiles at the Jerusalem Council. He was also confronted by Paul for his thoughtless inconsistency toward Gentile Christians in the presence of Jewish Christians at Antioch. Toward the end of his earthly ministry, Peter is the writer of the two epistles that bear his name. And finally, he becomes one of the martyrs of the faith who died serving in the first century church. His execution occurred in Rome sometime during the reign of Emperor Nero after the fire in Rome, sometime after July of 64 AD. And although his death is uh, prophesied in John 21, the tradition from the church tells us that on his way to be executed as a follower of Christ, he requests to be crucified upside down because he did not believe it was worthy to be killed in the same manner as his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This great apostle was a powerful man used of the Lord despite his weaknesses and despite his inconsistencies. Isn't that just like our Lord? To take the loud and the proud and the brash and the bold and the consistently inconsistent, strong one minute, weak the next, and by his perfect sovereign will, use them to advance his kingdom and bring glory to himself. He uses people just like us. So who was Peter writing to? Who were the recipients of this letter? The scriptures tell us that there are people that are living in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, They're in what is currently modern-day Turkey. Pontus was located in northern Turkey along the southern coast of the Black Sea, and then Galatia is in the northern part of the inner plateau of Asia Minor. And Cappadocia straddled the trade routes, and Asia was, uh, was part of that section over to the, to the west in Turkey, made up many, uh, of many of the churches that John wrote to in Revelation. And then Bithynia is up on the shoreline. You might take a look at a map. If you have the book of maps in your Bible, check that out. And you will understand that Paul personally ministered to the ones to the south of the Taurus Mountains, but it was Peter in these letters that he was writing uh, that he called out to these folks here. And these recipients were identified. He used specific words to identify them. He identified them in three ways. They were exiles, they were scattered, and they were chosen. Regarding exiles, the word here... uh, basically conveys people who have settled down against or alongside the unsaved. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, 11, he uses the same word. He'll use the phrase sojourners and exiles. And it's a very simple concept for those of us who live in the D.C. area. If you've been here for any length of time, uh, you realize that uh, most everybody who lives here came from somewhere else. That's Basically, yeah, just out of curiosity, how many people were born in the metro D.C. area? Raise your hands. Okay, we should start a little group together, of a sort of fraternity of locals, because the rest have been, come from other places. Uh, Those of you who are in the military, you know what it's like. You go home to uh, to your spouse, you tell them, well, I've just got the orders. Where is it? The Pentagon, Washington. And then there's this wailing and crying and weeping that uh, it just cascades out throughout your house. And there's this 
suffering and, and agony and they've heard what it's like. You know, you, you, you go there and it, you, it's a long commute and it's long hours and it's, you know, people inside that building trying to work their way up the, the food chain and they, they use the people who have lower rank to accomplish that and you just, it's awful, it's dreadful, it's just miserable. No wonder they give you medals when you retire. I mean, it's tough. But that's sort of what it's like. And, and so here, you know, in this situation, in this letter, uh, Peter is telling them that they are, they're in that area. They are a, they're in exile. This is not their home. He's reminding his readers that we live among the unsaved. They are always observing us. And it's important for us to consider that and to consider how we can be a witness, a strong witness to them. One of the great uh, country gospel singers was a guy named Jim Reeves, and he made, out of a, he made this a hit out of a very theologically correct song. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Paul or Peter also described them as scattered. Use the phrase diasporus. It's, uh, it's where you take a seed and scatter it. It pictures a farmer dipping into a bag of grain, of seed, and throwing it out into a prepared field and hoping for a bountiful crop that will be realized at harvest time. Now, Peter uses that that imagery in the same way. Believers are scattered from their homeland and a stranger in this current residence. Uh, some of these Christians were living, uh, had been living outside of Palestine for many centuries. In the old days, what would happen is the, uh, uh, the Assyrians would come in, they'd take over, and then they would start moving people to live in different locations. So you can't get, you know, they would never sing the song, this land is your land, this land is my land, because they were in a different land. And that's how, that's how people lived back then. And so uh, it was not uncommon for, for that to be taken place. And so these, these Jewish Christians, they had lived in this area for a long time, and now they had come to faith in Christ. Uh, they were not a part of, of Israel. Uh, they, were, they longed to be in their homeland, but they were, being, they were scattered for a purpose. And the purpose was for the, for the advancement of the gospel. And so uh, it was important for them to be able to uh, to understand this concept that they are not locked in uh, to a homeland. Their homeland is far away. It's in glory. And the application for us can be made for all of us. We who are saved are providentially placed by God in the midst of the unsaved, commissioned to proclaim Christ among people from where we have been placed so that they may believe. And then finally, the other uh, phrase that he uses is they are chosen. This is not a new concept. God has been choosing since before creation. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a, pe a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for this treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. This is what Moses said to the Israelites. Paul told the Ephesians in the first chapter of his letter, In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. Paul then told the Thessalonians in, his first, in the first chapter of that epistle, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Now, I know that the issue of God's predetermination and man's free will have been argued for centuries. And whenever you bring this topic up, it's like you, I picture two gigantic sumo wrestlers. <laughs> One free will and the other is predestination or the foreknowledge of God. And it's like they're going to go at it. And the, uh, the one uh, who launches himself out proclaiming free will does so whenever he decides. And the other, well, he's chosen to stand firm in his conviction. Josiah Condor, editor of the Congregationalist Hymn Book in the first half of the 19th century, penned this hymn. 
Tis not that I did choose thee, for, Lord, thou, that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, but thou hast chosen me. Thou from sin that stained me has cleansed and set me free. A vole thou hast ordained me, that I should live for thee. To a sovereign mercy called me and taught my opening mind. The world had else enthralled me to heaven glories blind. My heart knows none before thee, for thy rich grace I thirst. This knowing, if I love thee, thou must have loved me first. Peter demonstrates this, that God's election of us to salvation is a completed work. And as he continues on in this passage, he notes that the three persons of the Trinity are involved in that. He says in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Our salvation is a work of the God the Father, according to the foreknowledge of God. God knows all things. He doesn't just have knowledge. He is knowledge in his entire being, and it's filled with knowledge. The mind and knowledge of God exists beyond existence of anything else. He knows what has happened, what will happen, what is happening. Nothing takes him by surprise, nor does anything take place apart or outside of his will. Writer of Hebrews has said, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God knows who the elect are and the non-elect. He knows the saved and the unsaved. He knows the acceptable sacrifice from Abel and the unacceptable sacrifice that he rejects from Cain. He knows the one who will be given the birthright in Jacob and the one who will reject the birthright in Esau. He knows the one who will be faith, a faithful Moses and he knows the one who will be a stiff-necked and unyielding Pharaoh. He knows the one who will betray his son in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew from eternity that Christ would die for our sin, and he knew from eternity past those to whom he would, he would choose, who would believe in Christ and be born again. The only one who has absolute, unquestioned free will in all of the universe is the one who spoke it all into existence. So our salvation is by the foreknowledge of God and it's by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. The second aspect of this is that it's seen in, in how the Holy Spirit produces faith, it produces repentance, it produces regeneration and adoption. The Greek word uh, sanctify means to be set apart. The second aspect in the salvation of a sinner is exercised by the Holy Spirit who brings the one chosen to an act of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the sinner is set apart from their life of sin to a new life in Christ, from darkness to light, from unbelief to faith, from love to sin to a love of righteousness. And then finally, our salvation is a work of the third person, or the second person of the, whole, of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, to obey him and be sprinkled with his blood. God the Son cleanses us through his blood. This imagery comes from the Old Testament, a Levitical ritual whereby when Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai, he, he brought all the people together, he recounted the law to them that they were to uh, to fulfill, they erected 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes. He built an altar. They made sacrifice. He took the blood and splashed it on the altar. And the people pledged their obedience. And then Moses sprinkled the people with the sacrificial blood, taking it and just sprinkling it upon them. And the blood sprinkled upon them was symbolic of their intention to obey and follow the law of God. And in our hearts... When we come to faith in Christ, his blood allows us to, be, to fully realize that we walk in obedience to Christ and obey his word. 1 John 2, 3 through 6 tells us, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not him. But whoever keeps his word in him, they truly love, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. His blood covers our sin. His blood cleanses us from sin. And therefore we have 
these three persons of the Trinity participating in our salvation. God chooses to bring the sinner to salvation. The Spirit brings the sinner in a chosen act of faith. And the Son calls the chosen sinner to obedience and cleanses him with his blood. Perhaps some here tonight may ask this. and They ask the question, sometimes it's often asked, how can I know whether I am one of those chosen of God? And the answer is simple. Do you love him? Do you think on him? Do you care about him? Do you appreciate what he has done for you? That he has made atonement for your sins. And that God has brought you to the understanding of this. And that you are his. And that by faith you have life. And his son has cleansed you from your sin. The foreknowledge of God is powerful. The sanctifying work of the Spirit is amazing. The sprinkled blood of Christ is indeed miraculous because of what it does for us in saving us. To conclude this passage, there was a traditional greeting, grace and peace be multiplied to you. And seven other New Testament epistles offer this same type of greeting in the beginning of a letter. And so it's fitting that Peter would impart to them God's grace and peace, which is truly miraculous. So to some, God uses, God uses whomever he pleases to do his work in advancing his attentions in accordance with his will. Just look at the different types of men and women that Christ selected, those who would be his disciples, those who would be his followers, those who he would use, blue-collar fishermen, well-educated, well well-kept people. Just think of the disciples and the different types of people that they were. God uses wonderful people. God chooses as well. He's been making choices from the very beginning. He chose to create all things. He chose to make man in his image. He chose to make woman from man. He chose to set limits. And when those limits were violated, he chose to confront sin and to render consequences. But the greatest choice that he made was the choice to redeem us. And he chose to redeem us through his son. And he sustains that redemption through his spirit. And then finally, God blesses. He saves us to use us to do a work that he has prepared for us to do. We are blessed that we exist under the purposes and plans of an all-loving, all-knowing God. And the fact that he would use me, the fact that he would use any of us, is beyond comprehension. Reflect for a moment on the time and place when you embraced his gift of salvation. When Christ became real to you. Do you recall what was said? Who you heard it from? What that felt like? For some, it may have taken a while to connect the spiritual dots in your life, but for others, it came together quickly, maybe immediately. But somewhere in your journey, the light of understanding came to you. Illumined by the Spirit of your need for a Savior, you came to faith in Christ. And God the Father has chosen you from eternity past and realized it in the present so that you can celebrate with Him in the future, in the glorious eternity. What a great God we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness in saving us. Thank you for choosing us. We don't understand it. Lord, we don't deserve it. But because of your love, your grace, because of the work of your spirit in our hearts, because of the sacrifice of your son on a cross, you have given us life. And we celebrate, Lord. Thank you for that. We ask your blessing as we would leave tonight that we would honor you and that we would communicate the good news of Jesus to others. And we ask this in his powerful name. Amen. You have been listening to Emmanuel. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. 
Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.